This will just be a quick video in which I look at the solution to a couple problems from chapter eight, two of the easier problems from your homework. Here's an unlikely scenario. You have a, a wooden block on a frictionless table. That's important that there's no friction. And it's orbiting in a circle around a point through which a string is threaded. So there's a string attached to this block. The string passes through a hole in the table and from that string is suspended another mass, M2. And the masses are not necessarily equal. And your first instinct probably is, why doesn't this thing just fall? What's keeping it from falling? Well, the only other thing touching it, or the only thing touching it, is the string. Sure, there's gravity pulling down. The string pulls up. So there must be tension in the string in order to keep this thing from falling. What would the tension have to be? It's pretty clear it has to equal the, the gravitational force on mass two. Well, why would there be tension in the string? How could you establish that tension? Well, there, there must also be tension here in order to accelerate this block towards the center. If this block is going around and around, we know that it has an acceleration towards the center by virtue of being in circular motion. And that means there must be a centripetal force. And I should make an important point here uh, so this is a point of confusion for a lot of people. Sometimes people think of the centripetal force as its own entity, like uh, some extra force that you have to go looking for. Centripetal force really just means the, the sum of all forces that happen to be pointing towards the center of the circle. So in this case, the tension would be a centripetal force because it's directed towards the center of the circle. That's what the word centripetal means. Okay. We're interested in finding how fast this thing has to go, mass one. How fast does mass one have to go to keep this mass in equilibrium? Well, we know that the, the faster it goes, the greater its acceleration. The greater its acceleration, the greater the, the necessary centripetal force, which is the tension. So uh, the heavier this thing is, the more tension you need, the faster this thing would have to go to produce that tension. So it's, it's not a very difficult problem once you set up your free body diagrams. Let's do Mass two, here's a dot to represent mass two. And I suppose I could call this the, the positive y axis as far as mass two is, is concerned. So this will be the positive y axis. I've got the tension pulling up on mass two and I have gravity pulling down. And I purposely gave these two vectors the same length because I'm assuming that mass two is in equilibrium. That means the net force on mass two has to be zero. And we'll say that the sum of the forces in the y direction is mass times acceleration in the y direction. There is no acceleration, or shall I say the acceleration is zero. T gets the plus sign, gravity gets the minus sign. The sum of the forces must be zero because this mass is not accelerating. So that was pretty easy. We know that the tension has to equal the weight of the hanging mass. That's a lot like your force table lab, right? You had some masses hanging off of pulleys and we took the tension to equal the weight of those hanging masses. All right, now we know what the tension needs to be. How do we establish that tension? Let's go now to mass one. And I guess the first thing we have to do is decide what, from what perspective will we be drawing the free body diagram? Remember, for something in circular motion, we use this special set of axes. <clears throat> this is um, prior to this chapter, we don't use these, these labels, but if this block is going around like that, let's say counterclockwise, then there's an axis that's tangent to the circle. We call that the T axis. And I've already written the, the letter R for radius, and that just so happens to equal or to be the direction of the axis that we call R. And then you've got this axis coming up like this called Z. So I, I suppose I could have called this the Z axis for mass two. It doesn't really matter what you call it as long as you're consistent or as long as the person reading your work can tell what you're referring to. So I think that I will draw, okay, let's say this is the, an edge on view of the circle in which mass two is moving. So. This is the, this dot represents block, I'm sorry, not mass two, mass one. This dot represents mass one. This is the circle in which it's moving. So the center would be right here. And that means this is R. 
the radius. And I see a couple forces here. I see gravity pulling down on mass one. I see the table pushing up on mass one. And I went ahead and made that force equal in length to the gravity force because there's no reason that mass one should have an acceleration along the Z direction. Remember it, for this class, every problem we do about circular motion involves zero acceleration along the Z axis. If, if you were accelerating along the Z axis, you'd be spiraling out of the circle and your trajectory would be, your short, uh, <clears throat> too many vowels there. Your trajectory would be more complicated than merely a circle. Okay, well, in a lot of problems, you would need to look at the sum of these forces in order to solve for N, because you might need N to determine some other force like friction. But in this problem, I can see the road ahead, and there's no need to actually write this equation. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go straight to the R equation. What's this last force acting on M1? It's directed towards the center. That would have to be the tension T. And I will go, I will go straight to saying that the sum of the forces in the R direction is mass times acceleration in the R direction. And remember, we have three equivalent formulas for the radial acceleration. Use the one that is most convenient for the problem that you're, you're doing. In this case, we're being asked for the speed. So let's go with the formula that uses speed. V squared over R would give us the centripetal acceleration. Sometimes it's um, most convenient to, to work with the period, and you would use the, uh, the four pi squared R over T squared formula. There's only one force along the R axis here, and that's the tension. Should I give that a plus or a minus sign? Remember, in your book, the convention is to give plus signs to forces directed towards the center. Okay, well, we've got one expression for T here, another expression for T here. I could number these equations as I often do, call this equation one and equation two, solve the two equations, but in this case, it's so, direct that it's unnecessary you know you could substitute for t here but that amounts to just saying hey both of these formulas are supposed to equal the tension and that means they have to equal each other by the way i left out the very important subscript one here we're talking about the acceleration of mass one okay so set these equal to each other m2g must equal m1 v squared over r they didn't actually give us numbers, so there's nothing, nothing to plug in. And we get this somewhat interesting result. Root RG times the ratio of M2 to M1. All right, now that root RG keeps coming up. That comes up often in this chapter. So if you're doing a circular motion problem and you see a square root RG, give yourself a little pat on the back because you're probably headed in the right direction. Okay, does it make sense? Uh, the bigger the circle that they're moving in, the faster mass one would have to be moving. That kind of does make sense because if you're moving in a large circle, you're almost moving in a straight line and that means you're not accelerating or you have a low acceleration. So not much tension would be required. Does that make sense? Like when you, when you make a very gradual turn in a vehicle, your acceleration is rather low and that means the centripetal force is also rather low. So in order to establish the required tension, the bigger that circle is, the faster you're gonna to have to go to compensate for that effect. Okay, so speed, speed varies with the square root of R. What about this? Uh, if you were on a planet with stronger gravity, you'd have to be going faster. That makes sense because the stronger the G field, the, the harder the tension would have to pull on this weight to, uh, to keep it from falling. So the stronger the G field, the greater the tension would need to be, the faster M1 would have to be orbiting. And lastly, if M2 is really big compared to M1, that suggests that M1 would have to be moving very fast. That also makes sense because the more massive M2 is, uh, again, the more it weighs, the more tension you would need, the faster M1 would have to go. Now, what about if you just increase M1? If M1 goes up, 
the required speed would go down. Why is that? Well, it takes a lot more tension to keep something massive moving in a circle than it does to keep something less massive. Uh, is there an easy example we can think of? Hey, have you ever have you ever played that game with a kid where you grab their hands and like you have to do this out on a lawn or some soft surface, not on concrete. You grab their hands and you're standing and you just spin around until you're going fast enough that their their whole body lifts off the ground. I had a babysitter as a kid that used to do that. It was a lot of fun. But uh, if you were the person, if you're the babysitter spinning these kids around uh, by their hands, yeah, that sounds, you wouldn't want to do that with uh, somebody too small because their shoulder joints would be delicate. You got to do this with like, uh, you know, somewhat older kids. <clears throat> anyway, the more massive the kid is, the harder you have to pull to keep them moving in that circle. Anybody who's played that game can probably relate to that. It's harder to spin the heavier kids. The tension in your arms would have to be greater, even though they might be moving in a circle of the same radius. Okay. That's, uh, that's all there really is to say about that problem, but don't forget that root RG. In fact, I am gonna relate that right now to orbit around a planet because it's so easy to do. Let's look at low Earth orbit. Here's planet Earth. And here's my uh, fictional continents here. This is some supercontinent that's going to exist in the future. And suppose you've got a satellite orbiting really close to the surface of the Earth. And truthfully, low Earth orbit would classify as something even closer, but if I draw too close, it's hard to interpret the picture. So, lowercase r is the distance of the satellite from the center of the Earth. And for low Earth orbit, r is basically equal to the radius of the Earth. I mean, sure, there's another uh, you know, couple thousand feet or whatever, but that's insignificant compared to 6,000 kilometers, over 6,000 kilometers. So your distance from the center of the Earth is more or less the Earth's radius. But for now, I'll just refer to it as r. And uh, this is obviously a circular motion problem. You've got your your satellite going around and around, presumably in a circle of fixed radius. Later in the semester, when we get to chapter 13, we'll talk about elliptical orbits, but for now, let's, let's imagine a circular orbit. And that means we can say some of the forces in the R direction is mass times acceleration in the R direction. I only see one force, that's uh, the gravity force. So the gravitational force directed towards the center, so it gets plus sign, has to equal mass times acceleration. Let's go with V squared over R. Well, we know one way to calculate the gravitational force is to take the satellite's mass and multiply by the strength of the G field. And we are immediately led to the conclusion that the speed must be root R G. How about that? the square root of RG, same expression you saw a moment ago, even though this is a different problem. And I, I will point out that this is not necessarily 9.8. In fact, if you had something orbiting way up here, much higher orbit, do you really think that if you, uh, if you were an astronaut who somehow made your way up here, if you dropped a baseball towards the Earth, is it really gonna pick up speed at 9.8 meters per second per second? I think way out here, it's going to accelerate at a lower rate. The G field is going to be weaker out there. So it might be 9.5 or under 9.0. It just depends on how far out you go. Okay. A classic problem, which is related to the previous two problems, is uh, this physics demonstration. I don't actually do this in class because I don't want to drench myself because most, most of the time I try to do a demo in class, it goes wrong. But on Canvas, you can find some YouTube links. I think they're, uh, it's entitled Steve Spangler, Water Balloon, something to that effect. But there's a, a news anchor in the, in the middle of a newscast. This uh, science enthusiast comes in and has the news anchor put a beaker of water on a little platform with some strings attached 
and the news anchor has to spin the beaker of water around in a circle fast enough so that it doesn't fall out at the top. And you may have done something like this also as a kid. You may have discovered that if you swing, if you swing that vial or vessel, whatever, bucket, usually a bucket that you would have had, plastic bucket, maybe you were at the beach. If you spin it fast enough, as it goes over your head, the water does not actually come out. Let's take a look at why that is the case. So I've put MW for mass of the water. Let me do a free body diagram down here for the water specifically, not the beaker and not the platform. I'm looking at the mass of water. So what are the forces on the water? Well, because the water has mass, it's being pulled down by gravity. And what else might be exerting a force on it? Remember, if it's not gravity, it has to be something that's actually touching the water. The only thing I see touching the water would be the beaker itself, and then uh, really the bottom of the beaker. Yeah, because the platform touches the bottom of the beaker, the glass of the beaker, and then the glass pushes on the water. Now, it's also true that there's a contact force between the sides of the beaker and the water, but those forces would be sideways. Right now, I'm interested in forces towards the center of this circular arc, so I've indicated the radius here. So the only force I see that could be directed towards the center would be this force that exists between the bottom of the beaker and the water itself. And I'm gonna call that a normal force because remember, if this is the bottom of the beaker and this is the water, the beaker would push on the water in this direction. This direction is normal to the surface, hence been a normal force. Okay, I don't see any other forces acting along this, the, uh, the radial axis. Again, there, there's probably forces between the sides of the beaker and the water, but those would be directed along what you might call the t-axis. So, some of the forces in the r direction have to equal mass times radial acceleration. I see two forces that, uh, that are both directed towards the center, so they should both get a plus sign. Now, hopefully you, you can conceptualize this. The faster you whip this around, as you whip it around faster and faster, the acceleration will become greater. Oops. The, the faster you whip that uh, beaker of water around, the greater the net force in the R direction would have to be. Well, you can't change the mass of the water, so the normal force would have to increase to provide that additional acceleration. So N tends to get bigger as you whip this around faster. Conversely, as you go slower, less centripetal force is required and the normal force can afford to be smaller. <clears throat> what happens when you slow down until you're going just fast enough to keep this water uh, accelerating in a circle without actually falling towards you? You go any slower than that and the water is going to fall out of the beaker. What happens to the normal force when the water separates from the bottom of the beaker? That's when the normal force goes to zero. So evidently, the minimum speed required to keep this water from falling out, that minimum speed uh, corresponds to the crossover point between having a normal force that's greater than zero and no normal force. So I'll say at V min, the normal force goes to zero. And then this equation becomes simpler. Do you see that the masses cancel? You would have this. That's a very simple, simple statement. What does it say? It says that your centripetal acceleration, V squared over R, must be numerically equal to the free fall acceleration, 9.8. That's a very straightforward result. And when you solve for V, there it is again, that root RG. So whether you're talking about a satellite orbiting planet Earth in a circle of um, radius, you know, 6,000 kilometers, or whether you, uh, you may be talking about something as mundane as whipping a bucket of water around in a much smaller radius. The point is, if the only force doing the acceleration, doing the accelerating is gravity, this result must, must hold. In this picture, there were no other forces on the satellite besides gravity, at least in the R direction. And so the speed had to be root RG. Same thing here, we're, we're looking at the specific speed 
at which the normal force is zero. You're just going fairly fast enough to make that bucket of water around or go around without falling out. Okay, I just did that thing where I double tapped the pause button. And anyway, I thought that, that this was recording for the last five to 10 minutes and it wasn't. I don't recall when I made that goof. So I may be repeating myself. You can just fast forward if that's the case. I was talking about uh, the difference between whipping this bucket of water around and letting something just fall straight towards the earth. I think I'm, I did talk about this before pausing the video, but just in case, um, if you let something fall straight towards the ground, as it's falling, the velocity vector is always vertical. Well, we know that the, that the uh, gravitational vector is also vertical or pointed straight, straight down. So the velocity vector is always parallel to the gravitational vector, but we know that velocity is always tangent to trajectory. This is a, a degenerate case because the trajectory is just a line that goes straight down and the acceleration is always tangent to that trajectory. So it might be appropriate to think of the gravitational acceleration as a tangential acceleration if you've just dropped something and let it fall straight down. So under normal circumstances, well, I shouldn't say normal circumstances, but the simple circumstances that we talked about towards the beginning of the semester, something in free fall straight down, the gravitational acceleration could be thought of as a tangential acceleration. In this problem, the effect of gravity is very different. Rather than make something speed up on its way down, the effect of gravity is to keep this bucket of water turning. Remember, if, if your velocity is this way and your acceleration is perpendicular, a perpendicular acceleration or an acceleration perpendicular to the velocity cannot increase or decrease the speed. The effect of that acceleration is to, is to cause the direction of V to change. It's to cause deflection. <clears throat> so it's still the same number. It's still 9.8, whether you're, whether gravity is causing something to turn or causing something to fall straight down. The numerical value is still 9.8 if you're near the surface of the earth, but the physical effect is different. In this case, when you've dropped a rock, gravity is causing that thing to speed up on its way to the, to the ground. But the effect of gravity on the bucket here, or specifically the water, is to make it turn. So it's not a particularly profound thought, but it's, it's one that most people are completely oblivious to. In fact, um, that didn't really sink in for me until well after I had taken this class the first time myself. But try to remember that this 9.8 that we've talked about so much it does not have to mean the rate at which something is speeding up. That's, that's the easiest or most accessible way to think about it. If you drop something and let it fall, it will speed up at a rate of 9.8 meters per second every second. But that's only if it's moving in a straight line towards the center of the Earth. If you're actually uh, whipping it around in a circle so that the velocity of your object is, is perpendicular to the gravitational acceleration, then that 9.8 means something else. It doesn't mean that you're speeding up or slowing down at 9.8 meters per second per second. What it means is uh, if you could determine the length of this radial acceleration, the length of that vector would be 9.8 meters per second per second. And that's equivalent to saying whatever the speed is at which you're, you're whipping that thing around, if you take that speed squared and divide by the radius of the circle it's tracing out, that has to be 9.8, right? The same number different physical meaning. And so the last thing I did here was um, look at an intermediate case. Here, the gravity vector is, is uh, purely tangential to the trajectory. Here, it's purely uh, centripetal. What if it was somewhere in between? For instance, let's, let's just go with the bottom picture here because I think this picture is better. If you've uh, hit a baseball with a baseball bat and it's tracing out its parabolic trajectory, so this solid line, pretend that's a parabolic parabolic trajectory. At this point along the parabola, we know that the velocity, the instantaneous velocity has to be tangent to the trajectory. And here I've drawn the gravity vector straight down towards the center of the earth. So here's, here's the ground. And I don't think you've seen this diagram before. What you can do now is, first of all, imagine, or try to picture the circle 
which shares, let's see, how do I, how do I put that? Um, it's called an, an osculating circle. You, you draw a circle that just barely touches the parabolic trajectory at that one point so that they each share a tangent line. So the tangent line to the circle right here is the same as the tangent line to the parabola. In any case, that, that circular arc has a center of curvature and you would resolve gravity into components, one of which points towards the center of the circle and the other is just tangent to the circle. So um, for a more general type of motion, and instead of these two extreme cases, you know, a perfect circle versus falling straight down towards the center of the earth, what if it's something in between? You can always resolve gravity into components, one of which is causing the baseball to turn. Right? If you look at it, um, the, the baseball is currently going in this direction. This component of gravity is perpendicular to the velocity. That will cause the velocity to change direction. The other component, the tangent component, is directly opposite the velocity. That would, that would cause the ball to slow down. So that's, that's really easy to visualize after you've broken G into components. One of those components, which I've chosen to call G sub R, that would, that would be responsible for the the turning of the ball, change in the direction of the velocity. And the other component, the component that's tangent to the trajectory, in this case, the parabolic trajectory, that is the component that causes a change in speed. Specifically for this picture, uh, it's responsible for the slowing down of the baseball on its way to the apex. Let's look at one more quick one from your homework. This is number 19. We're told that, uh, a person in a roller coaster, let me draw the little person here. Have you ever thought about how silly that name is, roller coaster? It rolls and it coasts. We'll call it a roller coaster. Kind of like the first, uh, the first short films that were made. Let's see, they used to just be silent films, right? You just see a black and white footage of uh, people in, in the West rolling around and Stage coaches are uh, shooting each other from the tops of buildings, and then they have a guy playing the organ in the background. And then eventually they actually brought speech into the movies, and they called them talkies, because people can talk in the movies. But oh, I'm putting the cart before the horse, because eventually they used the word movie. Was that before talkies or after? Movie. Instead of a, a still picture, it's a motion picture. The pictures move, it's a movie. All these words we use, they're kind of silly when you think about it. Um, where was I? Roller coaster problem. Okay, we're told that the, the roller coaster has a, a dip in it. And at the bottom of the dip, by the way, the, the radius of this dip, because the dip is an arc of a circle. It's 30 meters. And we're told that this person feels 50% heavier than they usually do at the bottom. Specifically, what the book says is the weight of passengers increases by 50%. They're using the word weight. Well, your book and many other books use the word weight to actually mean normal force. Um, remember, if you're, if you're just standing in an elevator that's not moving, the floor has to push up on your feet with the force that balances the force of gravity on your body. If you weigh 150 uh, pounds, 150 pounds, the floor has to push on your feet with the force of 150 pounds. Your feet push on your shins, your shins push on your knees, and on up. So that force, uh, in some sense, is transmitted through your body and you, you feel that, you're aware of that, the force that exists throughout your body, that's what informs your, your brain about your, your weight, how much, how heavy you feel. If the elevator then accelerates upwards, the floor has to push harder on your feet to get you to accelerate. And you feel that increased force throughout your body you feel heavier. So it's really the normal force that we think of as your, quote, weight. That's why I try to distinguish between weight and gravitational force. Okay. I neglected to do this for previous problems, but any circular motion problem in this chapter, you're using these three equations. The z-axis is often very easy because you always assume that the acceleration is zero. Sometimes there's nothing interesting happening in the t-direction, but you almost always need to write the radial 
direction in order to solve the problem. So in this problem, this would be the direction tangent to the circle, that's the t-axis. What direction would this unit vector be? It's kind of sloppy, but it's supposed to point towards the center of the circle. That's the axis that we call r. Where's that third axis? Coming out of the page. Let me see if I can draw that here. There we go. I just drew the z-axis here. I'll put it in bold. You see it there? Hmm. I'm not going to write the t-axis equation because they haven't made any mention of friction. Let's just go straight to the r-axis. And I'll say m is the uh, mass of the passenger. So I'm really about to draw a free body diagram, not for the roller coaster itself, but for the person in the roller coaster. It's the mass of the person. Well, I know that gravity pulls down on that person. And if, uh, aside from gravity, any other forces acting on that person would have to involve contact with the person. What's the only thing touching the passenger? That would be the seat. The, the seat pushes up on their butt. And I'm going to call that the normal force because presumably it's normal to, you know, the, the surface being the seat and the seat of your pants. And I know that I need to make that force longer than gravity. Why is that? Because this passenger is moving in a circle, which means there must be a force, a net force towards the center. Okay, and I'll say some of the forces in the R direction is mass times V squared over R. And what they're asking for is find V if the normal force is, well, excuse me, you tell me, if this person feels 50% 50 50 heavier than normal, that would be like their usual weight plus another 0.5 of mg. So I could just write that as 1.50 times mg. Okay, be careful. The forces that point towards the center of the circle get the plus sign, and the ones that point away get the minus sign. N is towards the center, so N minus mg is mv squared over r. Here's where we insert the 1.5 mg minus mg. Do you see how the m's cancel? Also, what's one and a half minus one of something? You're just left with a half. So 0.5 G is V squared over R. Interesting. So one simple way to think about this problem is simply, uh, if you feel 50% heavier, that implies that your centripetal acceleration is 50% of G. That's pretty straightforward. The seat has to push on you for two reasons. Number one, it's got to support you against the pull of gravity. If the roller coaster were not even moving, there would have to be a normal force on your butt of one times the gravitational force. But because you're accelerating, there's this, there's this additional contribution to the normal force because of that acceleration. Okay, so the speed would have to be root 0.5 rg. If you plug in 0.5, 30 meters, and 9.8, you should find that this roller coaster needs to be moving at 12 meters per second. And I think that translates to something like 27 miles per hour. That makes sense. I, I think I heard once that Space Mountain at Disneyland, that roller coaster, excuse me, that roller coaster moves at about 30 miles per hour. But, we don't really need to think about speed to figure out whether this roller coaster is reasonable. We can also just think about acceleration. Is this a reasonable acceleration for a roller coaster, half a G? Yeah, because remember four Gs, that's like a good thrill ride. One of those coasters at Six Flags that 
where you corkscrew around and you go through loops and loop de loops and um, then you're talking about three or four G's. Beyond that, it's not really safe. People could get injured or pass out, throw up all over each other. I didn't sound like your typical uh, amusement park experience. I mean, maybe there's some novelty thrill ride or th amusement park somewhere else in the country where people are into that sort of thing. But that's not what I expect when I go to Disneyland or Six Flags. Half a G, that's a very modest acceleration. Enough to feel it, but... <clears throat> Okay, and that's all there is to say about that problem. A very simple application of the dynamics of circular motion.